So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the baton to uh, uh, Mr. Tom Sargent. Tom, take her away. Thanks All for right. Being here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Eric, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, first off, I'd just like to thank everybody at uh, Capital Lighting for setting this up. We're excited to kind of show what's going on with the industry and the, the ever-changing uh, topic of LED and what we're doing about it and what we see the industry doing about it in general. Um, and hopefully you'll get some nice uh, applications out of it and really see where, where the industry is heading and how it's applicable to design and integration and design and all that kind of good stuff. Um, additionally, we'll kind of uh, touch on how LED compares to traditional sources. We won't get real in-depth, but uh, some of the slides will be pretty detailed, and I'm sure you'll have access to those afterwards if we kind of uh, go through something a little quickly for some of the eye charts and things like that. Um, and uh, just, finally, just, uh, to, to talk to that, Tom, um, we, are, we are recording this webinar, and we will be uh, having it on access on our website. So if there is something that you want to go over, you will be able to, to, to play the webinar back, pause on a certain slide. Uh, and both Tom and I are available uh, by email. We'll send up a follow-up email, and you'll be able to ask specific questions if you do on any of the products or any of the scenes that you saw set up. Great. Thanks. And then also I'll touch on Tech Lighting as a company, how we've um, gone about developing LED-specific products, kind of our philosophy, and also where we see our future going to give you kind of a, a sneak peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, so without further ado, I'll kind of jump right in. Uh, hopefully everybody can see the, the presentation now. You're still on the first page, right, Tom? Yep. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, so the next one is the LED opportunity. And you can see there's a quote up there. The future belongs to those who see possibilities before they become obvious. Uh, this is from John Scully. I think he was CEO of PepsiCo at the time. Uh, but this really speaks to kind of our mantra and philosophy as far as LED goes. It's an ever-changing animal. And um, as a company, we feel you have to have vision to look ahead of the target, not really um, aiming right at the target now because it's an ever-moving uh, industry and trend. Um, as the industry goes through a complete transformation made imperative by environmental concerns, impossible by the technology advances we're seeing, uh, we truly embrace the changes and really want to strive to be one of the leaders in developing uh, the next generation of luminaires. Um, and you know, the key for us is remaining diligent and proactive. There's um, constant upgrades and, and innovations, and it's up to us as a luminaire manufacturer to stay on top of those, and equally so relay those changes to uh, our customer base, whether it's uh, lighting showrooms or interior designers. Um, you know, anybody involved with the lighting processes, there are people we want to help keep educated and, and show what's happening in the industry. So why is LED becoming such a hot topic? Uh, there's a multitude of reasons. Uh, one of the main ones, obviously, is the increased environmental concern. Um, you know, everyone wants to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, global warming is a, is a relevant topic when it comes to this. Uh, you also add higher energy costs. If anybody's filled their car up with gas in the last week, they've seen you know, how much the um, energy costs are affecting and impacting um, consumers as well as corporations alike. Um, and you can see you know, a couple of the photos there. Uh, the polar bear, for instance, as well as showing some of the uh, relevant legislature and bodies like Energy Star and ROHS, which is Regulation on Hazardous uh, Substances, um, which is kind of a, a governmental body regulating things like lead and, and other hazardous materials used in the production process. Uh, additionally, I think everyone's probably seen the legislation on uh, banning of incandescent sources. Um, the U.S. is part of this. Uh, in fact, in this year, the 100-watt incandescent, as we know it, um, is being phased out. And you can see there's a gradual phase out over time does not mean incandescent lamps are going away. They just have to get more efficient. Uh, but it's in addition to just this uh, national um, statute, there's also local ones like Title 24 in California, which uh, limits the, the efficacy that your fixture has. So it has to have a certain energy level in order to be used in a residence, for instance. Um, and every state is adopting their own regulations along these lines. So it's imperative that we all 
know what the regulations are as well as from our side as a fixture manufacturer, we have a responsibility to make sure we're designing and um, creating fixtures that conform to all of these various regulations. Locked up. Bear with me here. I'm having technical difficulties. All right. There we go. Um, additionally, uh, there's something called Hates' Law, which was a theory that is actually uh, becoming a reality. And I won't get too into this. It looks like a, a chart from our high school economics class. But uh, essentially, what he proposed is um, over time, much like most things, as a uh, things become more acceptable, more used, the cost of LEDs is going to drop 10% or 10 times per decade, while the efficiency or the amount of light you're getting out of that same footprint or package is going to increase 20 times over that same decade. And this is really um, borne out to be the case. Um, you can see where they're meeting at the X here. Um, so basically what that means is each year your light output per unit of energy increases 40%, and your cost drops 22%. So bearing that out over time, by 2015, an actual LED, so just the, the LED chip, will be 20% the price they are in 2010, while they will be um, increasing in efficiency where they are 60% of the, the uh, light output per cost that you're paying for. Um, so really, the, the it's much like uh, flat screen TVs, for instance, where we saw them when they were first introduced and we saw the gradual progression over time where the, the performance and the cost kind of met in the middle. It's the same, same theory, only in a little more dramatic scale, actually. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind on this is the LED is just a portion of the cost of a, a light fixture, for instance. Um, and we'll touch on some of the other sundry items that go into it. Uh, but it really is a pretty dramatic uh, reduction that we're already witnessing as a fixture manufacturer. Yeah, and I'd heard of more. I heard of Moore's law before with the uh, computer chip. I had not heard of uh, Hates's law. So, learning something new. There you go. Um, additionally, kind of some more supportive data on this. Um, McKinsey and Company was a consulting firm, very famous. Uh, did a study on just the lighting industry, which is pretty amazing in itself. McKinsey is obviously a very renowned uh, research firm, consulting firm. Uh, this was uncommissioned, so they did this on their their own, uh, seeing how much transformation was occurring in the lighting industry, which you know is a very large market, but on the grand schemes of things, not something they would typically uh, go out on their own to to commission a study on. Uh, but they did it because they saw how much. Uh, turbulence there was in the market and, and new technology. Um, and so I'll share a couple of their findings in here, which is pretty dramatic as far as where they see the industry going as, um, and LED specifically. Um, so you can see the LED market share in North America. This is total value of lighting purchase. So in 2010, 7% of all lighting purchased in the U.S., or excuse me, North America, was 7%. Uh, their prediction is by 2016, 45% of all lighting purchased in North America will be LED-based. And by 2020, 70%. So in a 10-year span, that's an unbelievable uh, growth percentage um, and really speaks to how quickly the adaptation is going. Um, and then as far as pricing, uh, kind of holding to Hayes' law that we saw before, um, by 2015, they are seeing LEDs will be 20% of the price they were in 2010 and 10% by 2020. So again, kind of staying on that same track as the previous slide. Um, and then they're also examining how LEDs can play a role in uh, human motivation, health, productivity, controls. Obviously, LEDs are um, have some advantages compared to some of the more traditional uh, energy efficient sources like compact fluorescent because of the controllability and dimmability. Uh, color changing, things like that. So um, it really got in depth and had some uh, stunning findings. Uh, here's another chart, and I won't 
get too far into it. Again, it's a, a little difficult to read, but really speaks to what I was talking about on the previous slide. Uh, so the first row of columns is the total percentage of units. So this is just true fixtures or lamps purchased. And you can see in 2010, uh, LED actually was 1% of the total number of units purchased in North America. Actually, this is a global slide. Um, and then going out to 2016, they are predicting 22% of all units globally will be LED. And then to 2020, 46% will be LED. So again, that's just tremendous growth um, supplanting all of the traditional sources we've kind of all grown up on, so to speak. And then the value base is even more dramatic. Obviously, LED has uh, a little higher upfront uh, cost due to some of the technologies and things than you know traditional incandescent sources. And you can see by 2020, they're predicting 78% of all money spent on lighting will be LED driven. So really some uh, dramatic figures that they're predicting for the future. And all the more reason for people like us to, to get on board and educate ourselves and, and know what's happening so we can get ahead of the curve. Um, when looking at LED, there's really kind of three models of integration. I'll touch on these briefly just to give you an idea what fixture manufacturers have to, to deal with as well as um, people working in the lighting industry or designing lighting know the different ways they can incorporate LED. Uh, first and probably you know the simplest would be LED replacement lamps. Um, there's a lot of good ones out there. Again, this is one area where you're starting to see a dramatic reduction in cost. Um, you know, I can just an anecdotal story. I remember four or five years ago buying a uh, a PAR lamp, and it was almost uh, seventy-eight dollars, eighty dollars, I believe, for the PAR lamp. Now you can go into a home center and get one for twenty-eight, twenty-nine dollars. So you've already seen that uh, reduction there. Um, and this technology is, is constantly improving and obviously uh, from a fixture manufacturer or a remodel application, things like that, you're not reinventing the wheel. You're unscrewing a light bulb and screwing a, a new LED version in, um, which again, the technology is growing. There are still some concerns as far as um, from a fixture manufacturer, if you're putting this lamp in there, um, obviously it does have heat buildup inside of a housing and things like that, but um, it is coming along. And then we're looking at new standardized LED components. Um, for instance, that is a, a Molex Helion in that photo there. And basically it's a twist and lock, almost like a replacement lamp type of scenario. Uh, the hard part here is trying to find standardizations and, and kind of picking a lane to make sure you know what's right. And then lastly is kind of the full custom integration design. Um, that track head there is actually a tech lighting track head. And it really is just we designed the fixture around an LED and had to create all the components and bits and pieces that go into it to make it work. Uh, but that really seems to be you know, where fixture manufacturers can separate themselves. Obviously, there's some difficulties with economies of scale, um, having to do some customized parts and bits and pieces that go into it. Uh, but all three of these will be involved in some fashion as time goes on. Really just kind of a, a quick. Uh, overview on what an LED is. Um, essentially, it's a semiconductor uh, where one layer has excess electrons, uh, the next layer has a deficit, and those electrons move between the layers, filling in the holes, and that creates a light output. Um, again, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but it is good to know that it's a semiconductor. Uh, it is, you know, that gets into how they're made via semiconductor chip manufacturer um, and, and the like. Um, next, just want to kind of touch base a little bit on the different types of LEDs that are out there. Um, there's a number of ways, and, and we're really just talking about white light sources here, uh, a number of ways to get, get white light out of an LED. Uh, the first and probably the, the most traditional or, or the one that's been around the longest is uh, an RGB, so a red, green, blue, and now they're starting to incorporate amber. Um, basically, it's like the old... Uh, color chart where yellow and blue make green. So you're mixing the combination of those red, green, and blue LEDs to kind of create a white light. Um, 
you know, this was the first option. It also allows for some color changing options, um, as well as the ability to incorporate control. So if you wanted to control the color of white that you had in a room, uh, for instance, if you had um, recessed lighting in your um, out in your patio area or something like that, and you wanted to mimic the sunset, you can control the combination of red, green, and blue to get a yellow or light like the, the color of sunset, or you can make it cooler during the day to mimic your high noon sun, uh, sunrise. Um, and this is something we're actually trying to integrate into one of our recess fixtures now, where it allows you to control the color of white that you have in a room, so you can really change uh, the feeling in the environment as you, as you choose. Uh, the next source is kind of the, the one you probably see most often, kind of the LED array solution. So it's a blue LED with phosphor yellow coating over the top, kind of looks like the, the egg yolk. Um, again, probably the most popular today. There's a number of uh, very large companies doing manufacturing in this sort. Um, very cost effective. Obviously, they're doing large, large runs for economies of scale. Um, there is some efficiency loss due to the phosphor conversion, meaning um, it's hard to get that yellow coating over the top perfectly even all the way around, so you do lose a little light here and there. Uh, but it also makes it very easy to get one constant color. Um, that yellow egg drop over the top, that actually determines what color you're getting out of it, whether it's cooler or warmer, between 27 and you know up to 6,000 Kelvin color temperature. And then the next one is called a remote phosphor. Um, and what this is, is blue LEDs, and then some space away from those blue LEDs, there's a flat layer of a phosphor coating. So similar to the yellow egg drop poured over the top, but it's actually a flat sheet. And it converts that blue light into white. Um, and it usually has a little chamber around it that all the, the photons bounce around in and make sure all the light gets directed out. It's really an efficient system, uh, but it is difficult to kind of control the beam angle coming out. So uh, if you had an application where you wanted a tight spot, for instance, it becomes more difficult with the remote phosphor application. Um, and this is the technology we're using actually in an under cabinet system, which we'll show later, uh, which is really kind of a unique application for it. And we, and we think uh, showing what is really possible with the different uh, LED technologies. And then getting into some of the terminology, and like I mentioned, I'll try to be uh, fairly brief on these, but I do think it's important to know, you know what the terms are, be familiar with them, um, how they apply. And the first one is color binning. So like I mentioned, uh, LED manufacturers are semiconductor manufacturers and they run large runs of these, um, you know, whether it's flat sheets or boards, and then they cut them into, into to the little die that you have. Um, but there is some color inequality between sections of, that are cut apart. Uh, so binning is really trying to control to make sure that when illuminated, one LED next to the other is as close as possible and doesn't have a visual difference. Um, you can see the, the rectangular picture on the bottom. So those can all be from the same semiconductor sheet cut into individual LEDs, but you can see the variances of all those different colors, which as a fixture manufacturer, as a, a designer, as an end user, you don't want a bunch of different color light coming out of the same fixture. You want uniformity. Um, so we work off of something called binning, which is trying to make sure that the variance between each of those LEDs is not noticeable to the human eye. Human eye, excuse me. So typically, people bin in three to four McAdams ellipses, which are the little um, facilli. Is that the the biology term I think for the uh, oval-shaped thing? Um, and that's really what the human eye can't differentiate. So you wouldn't notice the difference between uh, three McAdams ellipses. Uh, additionally, how do you compare some of the light sources? These are terms you'll hear all the time when dealing with LED and are important to ask when dealing with LED. Uh, the first one is LM80. Uh, we get asked all the time, do you have LM80? Um, LM80 actually relates to the um, thermal and life of the actual LED. Um, most LEDs, people say, last 100,000 hours, or fixture manufacturers will say 50,000 hours. Um, how we derive at that is actually through the LM80 data. 
it's the LED manufacturers themselves um, put their LEDs on a light test, and they have to run it at three different temperatures, and basically they're, they're gauging the output um, all the way up to 6,000 hours. And then they do this big mathematic formula to translate that out to how long it would last until it gets to 70% of its initial light output. That's the LM80 data. Um, when people ask if you have LM80 data, um, you know, most LED people say yes, uh, but LM80 data is not actually a pass-fail or a measurement of good or bad. It is just true data telling you how that LED performed over 6,000 hours. Um, then the question is, why do you only test it for 6,000 hours? Um, because no one would ever be able to get a product to market if they had to test it for the full 50,000 or 100,000 hours. By the time they reach the end of their life test, that, that product would probably be obsolete or um, not as good as the next generation, which already would have been developed at that point. Uh, next up is LM79. And this is the information you're going to want from a fixture manufacturer like ourselves at Tech Lighting. Um, this is actually the true light output coming out of either the LED. Some LEDs have LM79, but from a fixture manufacturer, we also do LM79 to give you a measurement of the true light that's coming out of the fixture. So we don't want to take what the LED has because there are losses, if, like for a recessed can, for instance, if it's recessed in the ceiling, or even track has the LED isn't always right at the very front of the fixture. So this gives you a true measurement of the light output and the efficiency of the fixture. Um, just good testing standards to know what they mean and what they are. Um, how do you compare different light sources? Um, these are kind of the, the big terms that you use to compare a light source. So lumen is the total amount of light emitted by a source. Um, a dinner candle, for instance, has 12 lumens. Uh, 60 white, 60 watt soft white A lamp has about 840 lumens. Now that's actually out of the candle or out of the fix, the light bulb, which you can see is round. So if you put it inside of something, you're not getting all of that light out of there. Um, then watts is the measurement of electrical energy, the unit of power being used. Um, you know, lamps are measured in watts to indicate the rate at which they consume energy. And then efficacy is your lumens per watt. So it's measuring, you know, how many actual lumens per watt you are getting from the lamp, or in our case, a fixture manufacturer, we do it as a, um, a fixture lumens per watt. Uh, places like California, for instance, Title 24, they require most uh, fixtures to be 50 lumens per watt, for instance. So there are guidelines on, on how much uh, efficiency you have to have in your fixture. Um, and there are things like lighting flax, which is a, um, a company or a, a, a program you submit your product to. You get to put this label on. Um, I think all of the LED lamps, as a matter of fact, need to have a lighting fax label so you can get an apples to apples comparison versus an incandescent, for instance. Um, and you are seeing it more and more on actual fixtures themselves, too. That's going to be like your standard information. People are going to be looking at lumens much more than they're going to be looking at watts. And, and, and this lighting fax uh, seems to be being recognized as, as the standard? Yes. Terrific. Very much so. Um, I won't uh, get into this one, to be honest, because it's a bit of an eye chart. But it's really a nice table to give you kind of the, the pros and cons of all of the different sources, incandescent, halogen, CFL, and LED, and really um, what sets each one apart and, and the value that and the LED brings, for instance. But again, I won't uh, spend too much time on that. Um, you know, we talk a lot about LEDs, um, which are great. Uh, the, the one thing I want to touch on is kind of some of the other um, componentry that goes into design of both fixtures and lamps um, that as, as people in the manufacturing side need to think about and key um, factors that incorporate into the fixture and affect the scale and the size um, as well as some of the dynamics of, of how a fixture functions. Um, first is the LED selection. Um, really first and foremost, there's a multitude of people out there with you know, varying products and sizes and footprints. Um, so for us, the, the first and foremost is picking which LED chip we want to use, which horse you pick. Uh, then becomes the board design, how those LEDs are laid out. Uh, then becomes thermal management, which 
Um, you know, you hear a lot, LEDs aren't, aren't hot. Um, they don't run nearly as hot as an incandescent or a halogen source, but they do emit heat, and it all comes out of the back. And heat is a huge detriment to LEDs. It'll actually drastically reduce the life of an LED if you don't get the heat away from it. So thermal management is uh, ultra imperative when doing LED fixture design, lamp design, that kind of stuff. Um, power supplies. LEDs typically don't run on 120 volt AC or 277 volt AC, so you need some sort of power supply, transformer, rectifier, etc., to convert the electricity to the proper voltage to run the LED. Um, optics. An LED, that little round uh, egg yolk, that's emitting light in 120 degrees typically. So if you're doing anything where you want controlled pattern, controlled output, you have to have some sort of optic to redirect that light into um, the usable shape that you want. And then photometric testing. The uh, doctor there is inside, it's called a gonial photometer, which actually measures the light output. And that gets back to the LM79 testing I mentioned before. Um, it's imperative that as manufacturers, um, we are testing these to make sure we're getting the performance that we're advertising. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that will do lighting calculations and things like that where it's their reputation on the line. They have to have the, the proper foot candle levels and areas. Um, so you have to have this testing to, to make it viable. Um, which all of those um, factors can add up and affect the system efficacy and the fixture design. Um, I won't get really detailed, in, detailed into this. Uh, but you can see what a dramatic effect each one of those pieces can have on how efficient your fixture is. The efficient design, for instance, um, we're using a 90% efficient power supply, a very, very efficient optic, and then operating at a, a much cooler temperature. And you can see how the lumens per watt is 62. Now, if you get into more inefficient power supplies, inefficient optics, and run it at a hotter temperature, that very same LED can get down to 46 lumens per watt. So those other factors are really key in a, in a fixture or a lamp design. And I just want to briefly touch on the tech lighting LED development and kind of our approach and, and give you a little overview of what we do and, and where we see the value of an LED source. Uh, we really have a, a, a two-pronged approach. One is integrating into existing form factors. It just makes sense to do some decorative pendants or wall sconces in LED. Um, they lend themselves, they hide the LED source, it, it really makes a lot of sense. And then the kind of creative side, building new products that wouldn't have been achievable if it weren't for an LED source. Um, you know, these form factors, they're very thin, they're very um, aimable and controllable, uh, something you couldn't do with a compact fluorescent, for instance. So it really kind of gets the the design group here, their juice is flowing, being able to think outside the box with, with what they can accomplish with an LED. Um, you know, we get asked a lot, whose LED do you use? And we're happy to share with every single one of the products we do in LED, uh, but we're really an LED agnostic company. We try to pick the LED source that fits what we're trying to design rather than say, you know what, we only use company X because we like them and somehow we'll shoehorn it in to fit. We try to find the source that works best for what we're trying to design. Um, and just kind of a rundown of all of the categories that have grown into LED for us. Um, and really just to give you an idea, we did not have any LEDs, LED fixtures, um, as early as I think it was five years ago we launched our first one. So all of these categories have filled in over the last five years. And I would say 75% of all of our product development ideas have an LED source incorporated in them in some fashion. Uh, so we have low voltage directionals, which are really known for um, monorail and kind of hand bendable track systems. Uh, we use a lot of LED sources in the directionals. Uh, line voltage directionals for our 120 volt bendable track systems. Pendants, which a lot of people know tech lighting for our decorative glass. I mentioned wall sconces, bath bars, flush mounts. Uh, we have a full family of recessed product and the new under cabinet I mentioned as well. So really, LED is a fabric across basically every product that we do to this point. Um, and it really is ready for prime time at this point. There's, there's really very few applications where you can't incorporate an LED due to the, the array of color temperatures and outputs and CRIs. Um, it really is kind of 
um, ready for prime time, as I said there. Um, and here's just kind of an example of the two, two paths I mentioned. So the IBIS fixture, which you saw before, this is really uh, where we said, you know what, let's do something that couldn't have been done before. So each one of those panels is uh, LED sources, 10 watts on each side, uh, really minimal profile, kind of a sleek, uh, aimable flood head there um, that, that wouldn't have been feasible with any other lamp source until LED came along. And then on the right, we have our element LED adjustable downlight. And you can see it, it looks like an adjustable uh, recess fixture, and it's incorporating an LED source into it. Then I've got just kind of some brief um, overviews or, or tables with all of the varying wall sconces and bath collection fixtures. Um, and everything you see here has multiple lamp source options. So um, we offer incandescent, halogen, compact fluorescent, and LED in all of these uh, sconce and bath bar selections. Um, and to be quite honest, several of them look much better in LED source than they do in any of the others because of the evenness of light and uh, the intensity you're able to throw onto the glass that you can't with some of the other sources. Uh, this was actually one of the very first LED products we did. It's a monorail head called the Helios. So you can see it mounted on our low voltage track system. Um, a lot of what we do, we try to make sure the LED is replaceable. Um, you know, we expect it to last for 30,000 hours. We do warranty it for five years. Uh, but, you know, should something catastrophic happen, we want to be able to replace it and make sure it doesn't have any disruption to the system. Uh, but you can see it's uh, 46 lumens per watt, a couple of different beam spreads, about 275 net lumens. And this fixture is 6 watts. And I uh, mentioned we introduced this four years ago, I think. And then you compare it to the Varion, which is a brand new fixture we're just launching actually January, so this year. And you can see it's 16 watts, so it is uh, substantially more, but look at the 800 plus lumens. So just in the four years, the output increase that we've seen in, in a fixture of this size is, is fairly dramatic. And we are truly reaching the MR16 output equivalency by the Varion head here. Um, as well as it's got uh, different beam spread options, 16, 20, and 45 degrees. The 16 degree, uh, a lot of people like real narrow spots is the most um, crisp and precise um, narrow beam that I've ever seen. It is truly spectacular on, on how defined and crisp the circle is that you get out of this fixture in the 16 watt or uh, 16 degree beam spread. That'll be uh, in Dallas for us to see uh, later this week? It will be. It will be. And right. I'd love to get your thoughts because it looks fantastic. Yeah, sounds um, amazing. Okay. Next up, we have the IBIS, which I touched on before. It comes in a couple of different footprints. You can see the single flood, double flood. Uh, we've got a dedicated wall wash, so it's got the hood on it to kind of create an asymmetric throw. Um, and all we think about now is, you know, well, dually. We look at how it looks and how it performs. So even in that wall wash, it's got a reflective material inside the hood there that's 98% reflective. So all of the light coming out of the LED is hitting your surface on your wall. Um, again, really kind of a creative um, fixture that wouldn't have been possible, you know, even two years ago. And this fixture actually won uh, Light Fair is kind of the, the big annual uh, lighting show here in the U.S. Last year was in Philadelphia. And this fixture won Design Excellence Award for uh, kind of most uh, provocative design of any lighting fixture launched last year. Uh, monorail LED pendants, again, they can be used as mono points as well. Uh, you can see it uses that same module we had in the Helios head. Uh, same efficiencies, really does a fantastic job of downward throw, so it illuminates your surface and getting some side light to kind of shown through on the glass and highlight the artistry on the glass. And again, here's kind of a brief snapshot of um, many of the number of fixtures that can be done in an LED pendant option. And obviously, there's uh, countless colors and, and configurations that can be done in each of these. So it really is a, you know, designed to your heart's content because we have a color to or shape to match for you. 
Uh, flush mounts, which are you know kind of a, a natural extension. This is a Pendenza fixture, for instance. Um, really gives the the appearance of almost an MR16 uh, downlight output. Uh, that glass disc illuminates to kind of give it a nice, clean, crisp look on the ceiling. Uh, it also has a recessed can adapter, so if you had a six-inch recessed can you wanted to, to retrofit, you could easily do it. Um, our boxy and circ fixtures, which are really popular flush mounts, again, kind of the, the best of, of all worlds. It's um, halogen compact fluorescent LED, um, really kind of a, a nice, clean, crisp look on your ceiling with the glass. Uh, with nice, these are wet label. They're also Energy Star listed. And that's obviously becoming a bigger and bigger uh, part of the industry and something we're moving to is getting um, our LED products Energy Star listed as well. Now that they finally have the, the regulations all sorted out on it. And then I mentioned our Element Recess family of products. Um, so this is an example of our adjustable product, which I mentioned Lightfair. This actually won uh, Best in Category at Lightfair. Uh, in 2011 for the recess product. So it's really, again, kind of showing our innovation and trying to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, but we really have probably the most complete small family of LED uh, products that you want. So these are three and a half inch aperture. We have a straight down light, uh, a wall wash, a remodel, a shallow housing. So if you do have an application where uh, you don't have any space in your ceiling, uh, elevators, for instance, healthcare, um, shallow plenum that'll fit in two by four construction. It works for that as well as the adjustable. And just showing the different shapes. We do square, round, and a flange and flangeless version. Um, Tom, a question came in regarding uh, they, they know that the, the LEDs give good light in a, in a small aperture, but would you recommend using LEDs, uh, these, these recessed housings, for general illumination in a, in a big space with a high ceiling? Um, they can be. Uh, for instance, we have our widest distribution is 40 degrees on um, our optics, for instance. Um, so you can space them, you know, relatively far apart, like six inches. Um, there are other people, if you don't have the, the space or you want to go further spacings like that, there are other people that have larger aperture um, that, you know, use different LED sources. Um, we have done general illumination. It all depends on the space and, and how far you want to space your fixtures, really. And and the throw, the throw, uh, you know. From, yeah. From, so the uh, larger your aperture, you can get into wider throws, like 60 degrees and things like that. A little tougher to do with the small apertures. Okay. Very good. Uh, and then the new category that I mentioned, under cabinet, which is really kind of the first um, inside the house type of product that adopted LED. It really made a lot of sense. You know, we've seen xenon lamps for years, and LEDs seem to be a nice, suitable replacement for the kind of traditional xenons that we've seen. Um, we're launching an under cabinet. We said, you know what, we we've, we've never done under cabinet before, but if we're going to do it, we want to make sure we're doing something uh, dramatically different. So. Um, you can see the photos there. We're using a remote phosphor technology for our under cabinet. So you can see the, the yellow line there. That's our phosphor sheet. And underneath that, we have a layer of blue LEDs. When those blue LEDs turn on, it illuminates the entire length of that yellow phosphor. So you can see the, the picture on the left in the, the lower right-hand corner of that picture. It shows what it looks like when it's on. It's solid white light. Um, so it really creates a nice, even, distribution of light. You don't get the, the singular hot spot. It creates one shadow. So when you have multiple LED um, under cabinets, for instance, you get a shadow from each one of the individual LEDs. Well, this is a single throw of light, so you only get one shadow from the, the light fixture. And then you can also see the, the profile on it on the next page. Uh, we're just comparing one kind of traditional LED under cabinet versus ours, and you can see the scale difference between the two fixtures, and then on the far right, you can kind of see the difference between those hot spots. Um, you know, the light outputs can be the same, but we're spacing it over the entire distance of the fixture versus four individual dots. So we think it, it's much less offensive seeing the, the single linear ray of light more evenly distributed. And then also you can see the output variation between the two uh, mixing bowls there to give you an idea of, of how the throw works. That's pretty dramatic. 
Again, it, it's the, the actual housing is less than three quarters of an inch tall, so it's really minimalist, conceals nicely underneath the cabinet. It's, it's really great. And then I just have some example installations here, just kind of comparing um, what a traditional incandescent source would be, for instance, versus an LED source. Uh, so we have a bathroom here. It could be a residential. It could be a hospitality uh, bathroom. So you see the two surface mounts, the wall sconces, and the recess. Um, you know, kind of your traditional setup. And this grid kind of explains the difference between the two, if you did it in a halogen versus if you did it in an LED. So the wall sconce, for instance, um, each one of those wall sconces takes two 40-watt halogen lamps versus the LED fixtures, which takes uh, a single 10-watt. So in the wall sconce alone, you're saving 60 watts of power. Um, the recess, there's three, three units in there at 50 watts apiece in an MR16. Our LED equivalent is 318 watts. And then the, the flush mount on the ceiling, the boxy. Um, 220 watts versus 280 watts. So you can see in this one room alone, um, the traditional halogen source is 310 watts versus the LED, which is 114 watts of power. So you're saving 63% of your wattage. Um, that can help you both on your energy cost. It obviously runs cooler depending on, on where it's at, if it's a place where it's on all the time, um, commercial spaces where they're, they're you know, counting their HVAC usage, um, as well as helping for things like lead credits when you want to reduce your watts per square foot footprint and things like that. So it's a pretty stark difference there. And you're not, you're not even uh, mentioning the longevity of the lamp. Right, um, yeah. And the, and the bulb savings and the manpower of changing those bulbs. I don't know if you have a, uh, I mean, we have a couple available, um, or if tech has their own um, calculator to show uh, um, both energy and, and lamp savings manpower on, uh, to show an ROI, return on investment of, of, a, of a project. I don't know if, you, if you've used one of we, those. We don't have one posted. We are happy to calculate for anybody that uh, is of interest to, to hear about it. But yeah, you, you build in the maintenance hours and HVAC and you know lamp replacement and all those things, and, and it becomes pretty dramatic, your ROI on it. Absolutely. Um, then just a couple more examples of uh, some bath bars and sconces, uh, really showing where you can use it. And, and you know, it's a seamless fit. There's no, you, know, you wouldn't know. Uh, and then getting into the kitchen option. So again, I'll compare traditional incandescent halogen sources versus uh, doing the same space in an LED, um, which again, there would not be a visual difference uh, to, the, to the common eye when you went in knowing there was variation. Um, you know, LED sources are available in so many different color temperatures now. You can really mimic an incandescent or halogen source. Um, so you can see there, sorry, um, recessed. Um, as well as the pendants over the island and then the under cabinet as well. And here's calculating the savings on uh, wattage consumption there. Uh, again, kind of running through the recess, the pendant, um, substituting our uniloom under cabinet as well as the pendenza over the sink, the, the recess over the sink. You can see a 74% on your wattage savings going from traditional halogen to an LED source. And again, the visual difference is, is very minimal. Most you know, most, if not no, nobody would be able to notice. And then another example of a kitchen here. So you can see the, the track lighting, the monorail track, and the three mono points. Um, traditionally, that would be the tech lighting arrow fixture, and then replacing that with the Helios fixture that we saw before. Uh, you're going from 450 watts, combining the track and the mono points to 76 watts. So an 83% wattage savings. Again, in areas where um, you're looking for lead certification, so you want to reduce your watts per square foot or meet Title 24 where you can't use some of the, the higher wattage transformers. This is really a, a dramatic difference. Tom, someone just asked about uh, dimming. Will they have to replace the dimmers if, if they're uh, going, you know, say they have 350-watt MR16s um, and they're changing out these pendants to be, you know, the, the LEDs? Yes. Would that um, same dimmer work? Yes, most, I, I, I'll caveat it, most of our LED is dimmable with the standard incandescent or triac dimmer, um, as well as low voltage electronics. So 
Um, it really depends on what kind of transformer they had in the ceiling before. Like our halogen monopoints, for instance, I'll use electronic, so it would be a, a, an apples-to-apples -apples replacement. You would not re need to redo your dimmer. Um, or if you had standard incandescent recess, for example, and went to the incandescent, again, it works on an incandescent dimmer, so there's no need to switch it out. There's no hum. There's no a a any no. any negatives to using. The, okay, uh, and that that's for most circumstances. I'm sure you know. It, it, it's the uh, you know more than eighty twenty rule. I guess I would say. Very good. Might be some exceptions, but but most of the time a regular dimmer can can work. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Great. Uh, and then here's an example of a hospitality project. So it's a, a restaurant with um, low voltage track lighting. You can see the mono points over the booths as well as the directionals on the back wall. The uh, relative comparison here. Again, substituting the Helios head on the monorail for the standard 50 watt MR16. Uh, the flush mount going to the Pendenza fixture and an apples to apples replacement on the recess. You can see for this commercial space, which again, your ROI becomes even more drastic because I'm assuming these are on more than your standard kitchen lights you're saving 85% of the wattage consumption of that space. Plus, again, you have a longer lamp life, so you don't have the maintenance cost of lamp change out. Obviously, it's hard to calculate the cost to a business of the appearance when lamps are out, um, as well as HVAC and other things. So it really becomes starts to add up uh, very, very quickly and, in the commercial side. And just, um, you know, as long as we're talking a little bit of technical, some, someone did ask about transformers. Will they need a transformer for each application? And I, I think um, it, the, the transformer in, in this situation with most LEDs is called the driver, right? Is that that's the... Yep. And, and, and yet, and generally, it's per fixture. Each one is going to have its own driver. It, it, I haven't seen an application where there's a driver sort of like in a, in a uh, canopy, and that shoots out uh, along the whole track or anything like that. It's, it's usually per fixture, correct? It's integrated with the usually, diode. Yeah, so like recess, it's usually integrated. But like the, the Helios directional head, which is in the, the upper right-hand corner there, for instance, that's a 12-volt mm -hmm. fixture. So that runs on 12 volts. So you could use it on a 12-volt mono monopoint canopy or 12-volt monorail. Um, and it actually has a driver built into the back of it that converts the 12 volts to the voltage that the, the actual LED needs. But um, most of it is integrated inside the fixture. So it takes regular 120 and, and mm -hmm. converts it to what it needs. OK. Um, and that's really it. Again, uh, thank you, everybody, for, for taking the time to, to hear what I had to say and to the Capital Lighting folks for setting it up. And uh, please, if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, and. Actually, Craig, uh, Craig sent a, a message. Could you go back to page six? I'm not sure uh, if that's easy for you to do, but uh, Craig is requesting that. And I'm a believer that if one person's asking a question, several people might have the same question. Um, somebody also sent a comment about LED flashlights that got recalled from Target, and if uh, what 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 that has. Uh, you know, to do with the LED industry, and I, to me, I'll, I'll talk to that. And it's it's about the quality of, of the chip and the driver and and the components that are being used. And and Target, uh, I guess, was not that careful, perhaps, um, on what they chose, and they they obviously recalled them. Tech is is one of the highest quality brands made in, in the entire world, and and uh, as far as I know, we we haven't had any uh, issues with any of your products that we that we've been selling for years. So. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, uh, Tom. But no, I, you know, we're we're extremely confident in in the product to, that we offer, and obviously that's uh, you know that's what we stake our reputation on. And I also think that um, you know lighting is meant to stay in an environment for an extended period of time. Uh, so in in general, I think the lighting industry in general is very careful about what they're putting in versus um, you know I don't know that a, a flashlight might be considered a more disposable item, so they might have. A little more license on that side of things, maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, all right. And I guess page, page six that we were happy to be looking at is just really a, a startling um, graphic uh, or, or, or display of how quickly LEDs are going to take on uh, the lion's share of, of the lighting market, how quickly they're going to be increasing in price and efficiency, uh, unless unless something else shows up. I guess would be. 
the, the caveat, right? I mean, there's there's OLEDs, which we're hearing a little bit about, and I don't know if, if you know anything on the horizon, Tom, that that is not maybe in the mainstream uh, conversation, but. Um, right now, it seems like LEDs are, are certainly where people are putting the, the bulk of their R&D money and, and fixture design. But uh, you see anything knocking it off its, uh, its path to domination? I do not. Um, I mean, there's always new things out there, and there's uh, you know variations of, of things that we've seen already. But I think uh, LED is certainly going to, to garner the lion's share. It's like you mentioned, OLED, which is... Uh, has some interesting possibilities, but um, hasn't quite reached that hate flaw uh, curve yet. Mm -hmm. Still on the more expensive side, but um, you know, just to, to kind of give you an idea, I've been doing this for a while. I've been in the industry a while, and literally the last four years have seen more transformation than my previous 15. So it's really unprecedented, and I think you know LEDs have a lot to go, you know, grow, and are certainly on the path. Uh, okay, I, I uh, want to thank you, Tom, for your uh, exceptional presentation. It, it was, uh, I, I, I thought I knew quite a bit about LEDs, but uh, you taught me definitely a, a bunch more today. Two or three things I did not know, and uh, I'm, I'm sure our, our people who attended today uh, would thank you personally if, if they weren't uh, all muted as per <laughs> the web <laughs> protocol. I will be sending around a thank you email. Uh, when I say I, I mean my marketing manager, Julia, uh, will be sending around a, a thank you email to uh, all the people who have participate, participated today. And uh, I, I think we'll be able to send a, a copy of, of the presentation materials, perhaps as a PDF. And also, like I said, we are recording this whole webinar. And I will send uh, uh, the link so that you can watch it at your leisure along with my email address and Tom's email address in case you have some specific questions. Um, We'd love to be a resource both uh, both today and, and in the future. So I thank you all for your attendance. Um, and uh, any any questions, Eric at 1-800-Lighting.com if you have something quick uh, before you get my, my email later on. But thank you, Tom, and thank, thank you, everybody, you. on the call. All right, have a great everyone. rest of your week.